Well, Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Great to see all of you. Um, so I, we're going to go ahead and begin. And welcome to the Land Loss, Reparations, and Housing Policy Conference here at Boston College Law School. Um, so for those of you who have not met me, my name is Odette Lino, and I'm the Marianne D. Short Esquire Dean and Professor of Law here at the Law School. And it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, so today's conference represents the public launch of the law school's new initiative on land, housing, and property rights. And I want to extend my thanks and congratulations to Professor Thomas Mitchell, who holds the Robert F. Reinen Endowed Chair. And is the director of the initiative, um, and to Professor Lisa Alexander, who serves as the initiative. <laughs> the initiative's faculty director for housing and property rights programs. Um, it's really wonderful to see such a wide range of attendees today, and I know people are going to be coming in and out for various panels, but I looked at some of the, um, the registration sheet, and it's really fantastic. We have academics, practitioners, government and nonprofit leaders, and members of the broader community. Um, it's an impressive group of individuals, each of whom have a unique and important perspective on the subjects that we're going to be covering. Um, and we have a fantastic and incredibly knowledgeable group of experts that are going to be speaking with us today uh, to address the interconnected issues and questions around black land loss, reparations, and affordable housing. Um, in my view, looking squarely at these questions and thinking seriously about how to address them very much aligns with BC Law's mission of training lawyers for others, of equal regard and justice for all, and of putting the needs and concerns of individuals, <coughs> families, and communities at the heart of what law and legal practice should be about. Many of you were at the conference opening last night at Harvard Law School with a roundtable discussion on black land and property loss and on reparations for such loss. Today, we continue that discussion with a morning panel featuring the Land Loss and Reparations Project and their estimation of the general impact of black land loss and, it, and an afternoon panel on complementary law and policy strategies to address this land loss, including litigation, legislative reform, and administrative and regulatory reform. Another major focus or theme for today's conference is the urban housing crisis, with a morning panel addressing the history of Boston's housing inequality and unaffordability, and an afternoon panel addressing possible housing policy solutions, which are needed by the many families and communities priced out of today's markets. I'll be joining again at lunch, and I hope many of you will be able to join us for a keynote conversation with George C. Fothery III, a partner at the law firm of Sidley Austin in Los Angeles, and the lead attorney for the plaintiffs in the Bruce's Beach case, which is the first in our country to require a government body to return land or compensate for land taken from a black family. While I'm here, I also want to recognize and thank the co-sponsors of the conference who joined with BC Law's Initiative on Land, Housing, and Property Rights, and these include the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic, the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School, whose director, Derek Hamilton, will join us today via Zoom, the American Bar Association section on state and local government law, and the Institute for the Liberal Arts at Boston College. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank our really incredible administrative team, um, including Nate Kenyon, Amanda Crowley, David Price, and everyone else who's been incredibly supportive. So can I just Thank you all uh, again for joining, and I look forward to seeing you for the lunch conversation. And now let me welcome Professor Thomas Mitchell, um, the director of our initiative on land, housing, and property rights. Thomas, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Sorry, I forced my class to do that every day. Um, so wait, welcome to the Land Loss Repar Reparations and Housing Policy Conference. As the dean indicated, this is our second event representing the launch for our new initiative. Um, I'm just incredibly excited about the initiative and the events constituting the launch. Um, I'm thrilled to be at BC um, for, for years, uh, 25 years. I've, in addition to my normal responsibilities, my research and my teaching, I've had uh, a substantial amount of legislative reform and policy work I've done, but that work 
up until coming to BC was always considered my side gig, my uncompensated, you know, nighttime side gig. So I'm, I'm thrilled that BC's provided support to make this uh, possible. The, um, and I want to echo the support of our support staff, David Price, uh, Samantha, the events uh, team, they've been awesome. So I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of some of the goals of this initiative on land, housing, and property rights. We uh, have four priority areas. I refer to them as the four pillars. So the first thing we're trying to do is train law students to be effective practitioners or policy folks in the space of real estate, housing, community development. That will manifest itself in a couple ways. We are developing a real estate and community development concentration to help guide students who have an interest in these areas to take the courses that will give them the ability to actually function at a competent level, uh, including taking a number of transactional courses that they normally would real estate, tax, corporations, estate planning. Um, and then we're also then trying to overlay that with some experiential learning opportunities, externships and internships. We've already begun, uh, David and I, rolling out some of these externships or internships. If you're from an organization that might be interested, please connect with David Price on that. Um, we hope to also in the next two to three years develop a clinic here that will be very targeted in its focus. It'll, our, our idea is to have it focus on so-called air property, tangled title, and estate planning. So that's gonna be the focus of what we're gonna be trying to develop. The second thing that um, we're doing is trying to, I call it the legislative and policy laboratory, essentially trying to build upon some of the legislative work I've done over the last 20 some odd years, which I see as a demonstration project, the uh, model state statute that I was principally responsible for drafting that is now the law at 20 <laughs> um, was considered impossible when I started. So I see that as a demonstration that these issues can be tackled. And what I'm hoping to do with this laboratory is then with resources, hopefully that will be successful with funders, uh, to convince them of the value of this, is put together teams of people who will work on issues of real estate, land use, community development, housing, where the law or policies are not serving uh, disadvantaged communities well. And then ultimately develop things like white papers that we can disseminate to important stakeholders, including but not limited to elected officials and policymakers. Third, you know, the research, I am a law professor, I'm a tenured law professor. Uh, my colleagues most understand when I do something that looks research oriented, conferences, symposiums, workshops. Um, so we are gonna sponsor a range of those. Today's like the first one, but sometimes they'll be just for academics, sometimes it'll be a mix of people, sometimes uh, we'll have other stakeholders uh, participate. And the last thing is, um, at the opposite end, not just training law students, but training people who are either practitioners, because there's a lot of lawyers, including real estate lawyers, housing lawyers, in practice, who in law school never kind of got trained on the real estate, housing issues, impacting disadvantaged people. And oftentimes, I've gotten contacted over the last several years by these lawyers who all of a sudden want some training on the fly. So we want to be proactive, sponsor continuing legal education, uh, seminars, workshops for lawyers, but also do community legal education for disadvantaged people and communities, because there's often a delta, a gap, between those people's understanding of what the law is that uh, impacts their property rights and what the actual law is. Sometimes they're um, unjustly confident and secure that they're protected, and it turns out they're not. Sometimes there's property laws and policies in place that are designed to help them that they don't know about and unfortunately they don't then take advantage of. So without um, any further ado, I'm going to let the first panel get going. So thank you again. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> my name is Steve Malpezzi. I'm a retired professor from the University of Wisconsin, which is where uh, Thomas and Lisa and I first uh, met and started to work together. Um, pleased to be here. Um, my job uh, is to moderate the session, so I'm just going to give some brief introductions to the panelists, and uh, then we'll get going. <clears throat> so first, uh, if you looked at the program, uh, unfortunately, uh, Derek Hamilton had a family emergency and will not be able to join us today. Uh, <clears throat> but we have um, uh, three fine panelists. Uh, <clears throat> our first speaker will be uh, Bryce uh, Stuckey. He's a, a, a freelance writer, mathematician, uh, data maven, and I would also call him, uh, I don't know if he would agree to this, an amateur historian. And I consider myself the same as well. So that's, a, that's not a shot, that's a compliment. Uh, he's written a lot of articles on diverse topics, including uh, a well-known paper uh, or uh, article in uh, the National Review uh, with some colleagues <clears throat> uh, here on uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, how the government helped white Americans steal black uh, farmland. Our second presenter will be uh, Dania uh, Francis. Uh, Dania is an assistant professor of economics at UW-Boston. She's written extensively on this subject. Uh, her paper some years ago on the economics of reparations uh, appeared in the American Economic Review and is one of the most cited papers in the economics literature on this subject. And recently she and some of the other colleagues uh, in the session uh, have a, a new paper in the AER on black land loss, uh, which I commend to you. Uh, final panelist, uh, won't be presenting, but will join us for the discussion, is uh, Thomas Mitchell. Uh, Thomas needs no introduction because he just introduced himself. Connection's <laughs> <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, but I'll just say a word or two. He's a longtime friend as well as a colleague. Uh, and um, uh, as is, uh, I mentioned, his wife, uh, Lisa, who is uh, handling the housing side of this conference, and I'm interested in both. Uh, I would say Thomas has done more than anyone else that I know to raise uh, this issue in the academic world, uh, you know, especially uh, in law, but also in economics. Uh, so what we're going to do now is um, have uh, 10 minutes from Bryce, who's got some slides to, sh to uh, give us a, a little introduction, uh, you know, to the the history of this a hard battle with the world, as he calls it, uh, black landowners in America. Then we're going to have about 20 minutes uh, from Dania, who's going to uh, go through some of the data work uh, and analysis that they, uh, the, the team has been doing uh, on, on the black land loss. And then we're going to, I'm told we're going to raise these, because otherwise we'd be hiding behind here. <laughs> and we'll have a discussion where I'll ask a few questions and then we'll take uh, questions from the floor and kind of get a, a discussion going. So that's the order of battle. And uh, I'd ask uh, Bryce to come forward and uh, take us away. And I'll give you a two-minute warning. Uh, when I sort of go, ah, oh, Bryce, okay, that's two minutes, record. not ten. <laughs> Just so you know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a brief history of black landowners in America back to colonial times, focusing on the uh, post-Civil War period. And I want to preface with this quote from W.E.B. Du Bois, um, the rise of a nation, the pressing forward of a social class, means a bitter struggle, a hard battle with the world, such as few of the more favored classes know or appreciate. So the there, there have been black landowners in America since at least the mid-1600s. Um, there were landowners in New York all the way to South Carolina by the early 1700s. There were actually 30 black farmers in Manhattan in the uh, late 1600s. And there were also black landowners in Florida and what's now the American Southwest. Um, and these, these pictures are of one family, the Chavez family, and the, the gentleman in the upper left was the first um, black ordained Presbyterian 
minister, and he was a Revolutionary War veteran. Um, after the Revolutionary War, there was a wave of manumissions and gradual abolition of slavery in the North. And there was brutal repression in the South where manumission was actually made more difficult. In spite of this, there was still steady accumulation by black property owners, and there were 20,000 at the eve of the Civil War. Um, so, move over to the side. After the, uh, after the Civil War, there was massive expansion of black landowners. They more than tripled. And this, this map is going from 1850 to 1870. And you can see in the last one how many more. The, you know, the darker colors show more landowners. Um, and, and people who were already free, Union Army veterans, wage workers, people with cash were in the best position to buy land. And there was no government land redistribution, although there was a land commission in South Carolina that bought and sold land at reduced rates. The, the Union Army um, occupied South Carolina, this part of South Carolina, from early in the war. And you can see that there were many more property owners there because the Union Army paid wages and sold abandoned plantation land there. So um, acquisition happened very quickly in the late 1800s. This is a graph that shows acreage in Georgia. It's made by Du Bois. And as early as 1880, 20% of black farmers already own their own farms. And that, that number it's, may actually be low. And by 1890, a quarter on their own farms. And a, a, a typical pattern was the family would save and save and get a few acres and then stop and enjoy uh, you know, the property that they were finally able to own. And many city workers would buy a couple acres outside town so they could grow food. And then there were also black farmers with hundreds of acres who made a lot of money. Um, so we estimate that there were over we say 16 million, I think it could be a few million higher than that, acres owned in 1910. And this was the peak for black landowners. These pictures are of uh, black farm owners and then the child of a black farm owner. Um, land gave many benefits. Um, there's, there's many studies from the early 20th century that show black farm owners could keep their kids in school longer, they had more farm equipment, they could raise more food instead of having to raise cash crops so they could feed their families. And black farmers also supported collective institutions. There were several black-owned banks at this time, black agricultural colleges, and there were black settlements in every southern state. And there was also what the Professor Omar Ali calls black populism or black rural political movements. And the, the largest was the Colored Farmers Alliance, which had two, two million members at its peak in the 1890s. And this, this graph shows the decline in black acreage from 19, relative to 1910. The green line is black acreage, the red line is white acreage. And you can see white acreage actually went up and it's come down in recent years. And there are a lot of reasons for the decline um, one of the biggest is the white supremacist politics of the South. Um, the peak of black land ownership came at the, you know, on the heels of the imposition of Jim Crow, the revival of the Klan. Um, it was around the time of the Tulsa massacre and other what are called race riots, but were white mob attacks on black people. Um, there, uh, there, there was a comprehensive study of lynchings that came out recently that showed that black communities with a greater share of landowners were more likely to be targeted. And this book, Buried in the Bitter Waters, documents many cases where a white mob would lynch a black person and the black people would leave the town and the white people would take over their property. Um, the New Deal was also very bad for black farm owners. Um, there was a huge expansion of government programs. Federal payments went from 3 to 31% of farm income 
from 1929 to 1940. The white, the the Democrats relied on their white supremacist Southern Bloc to pass this legislation. And those guys ensured that the money would be distributed under what they call local control, by which they meant white control. And the mechanism they had to do this was the USDA County Committee, which controlled resources at the county level. And while it was nominally democratic, open to democratic elections, it was always run by well-connected white people. So in, in the civil rights era, black farmers in the South were often um, leaders. Often there were, there were many one-man NAACP chapters, and that was usually run by a farm owner because they had some independence from white employers. And these, these two gentlemen are uh, farm owners, and they, they both ran NAACP chapters. And they brought activists into the South and gave them you know, sanctuary while they were agitating. And so USDA targeted these people to try to take their land from them and undermine their independence. The, the civil rights activists actually ran a campaign to integrate the USDA county committees in the mid-60s, but there was widespread fraud, um, tampering with ballots, threats of job loss, and the campaign was unsuccessful. And the civil rights era was actually the worst period of dispossession for black farmers. Um, I want to give one example of how this dispossession happened. This guy with the mustache is Norman Weathersby, who was a car dealer in Mississippi. And he would, have, he would give loans to black farmers, but make them post their land as collateral. And then his, his buddy, who was a USDA agent, would also give a loan to the black farmer, but he would delay it so that they couldn't plant on time and therefore they would harvest less than they'd expected, which meant they made less money than expected, so they had to sell part of their land to Weathersby or give it to him to make up the difference. And the AP reported that Weathersby acquired over 700 acres this way in the 50s and 60s. At the, around the turn of the century, there were two civil rights settlements that have become known as uh, Pigford, collectively after the plaintiff, Tim Pigford, who's pictured with his kids in the black and white picture. Um, it was technically the largest civil rights settlement in history, but most of the claimants only got $50,000, just not enough to buy a new tractor, and others got nothing. Um, meanwhile, there was a narrative that Pigford was rife with fraud that started with uh, Breitbart, but ended up in the New York Times. And this hurt public perception of Pigford um, because black farmers say their white neighbors thought they were getting paid off, essentially. And USDA agents also, they say, had that perception. And so a lot of black farmers say they're worse off now than they were before Pigford. And a, another reason for that is that Congress felt this issue had been settled, so they didn't want, you know, they weren't, they weren't open to helping black farmers anymore. Uh, there's still problems at the department, I mean at USDA. The Bush administration had 14,000 14, discrimination cases and they said only one amounted to actual discrimination. They routinely put the complaints in the corner and ignored them until the statute of limitations ran out. That was, someone who worked in the Civil Rights Office at the time told us that. The, Obama administration sent a smaller share of loans to black farmers than even the Bush administration, but both administrations only sent less than 1% of total loans. And the Trump administration had a bailout. We obtained data from a FOIA that showed 99% of that went to white farmers. So there's still many farmers, many advocates fighting USDA. This is a picture of some of the people who we, we work with. Um, and it can be difficult for them to get airtime or representation in politics. So if you have any interest in connecting with them, you can let me know and I will you know, put you in touch. And that's it.
Thank you. Um, again, my name is Dania Francis. I'm an assistant professor of economics at UMass Boston. And I want to thank um, the organizers, the sponsors um, for inviting me here today. And thank you all for coming out to talk about these important issues. So um, I have had the uh, pleasure of working with this really amazing team um, of researchers on estimating the value of black land loss from 1920 to 1997. Um, and our, as um, Professor Malpezzi mentioned, our paper is published in the AA Papers and Proceedings volume uh, from May of 2022. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the details today of the methodology and the data work behind what we did to get to this estimate of black land loss that we have. And so it's a little early in the morning for all of these data, but uh, please bear with me. Okay, so uh, county level data on acreage and land values are available from the US Census of Agriculture since 1920 in roughly five year increments. These data are digitized and available through the ICPSR data repository. And while state and national census of agriculture data date back to 1840, we restrict our analysis to the period for which county level data are available post 1920. And we carry our analysis through 1997, which was the last census of agriculture documented in the 20th century. In addition, substantial changes were made to the Census of Agriculture sampling procedures and adjustment methodology in the 2002 um, COA um, and, and after. So that kind of makes comparisons with the earlier censuses difficult and probably misleading. So that's another reason we kind of stop at 1997. Okay. Um, finally, we also restrict our analysis to the 17 states where almost all documented black farmers resided. Uh, the Census of Agriculture records acreage values separately by ethnicity in all relevant sample years, allowing us to estimate the acreage owned by black farmers. Acreage estimates are categorized as fully owned, partly owned, and operated. Okay. Um, an operator, uh, a person who runs a farm, can own, part own, or fully rent the land in their farm. Right? So the land in the farm of a, quote, full owner who owns all the land in their farm may not represent all of what they own, right, if they rent some of their property out. Furthermore, an owner who only rents their land out and does not operate any will not show up in the census of agriculture, right? So the land, um, the land in the farm of a part owner includes land that they rent, so the rented part has to be sort of subtracted out to get owned land, and we bear all these considerations in mind when we use the land and farms of full and part owners, right? So this is just a little bit of the data decisions that had to go into thinking about um, uh, how to represent this. Okay. Um, so, sorry, I should have clicked before. I'm showing you now um, black-owned acreage over time, um, and I have different lines. There's um, a line that's showing what does it look like if we include none of the partially owned acreage, right? What does it look like if we include all of the partially owned acreage? Um, and then what does it look like if we include this imputed measure of partially owned acreage um, where we base it on years where we know kind of an average percentage of um, how much of the partially owned acreage was owned, how much of that land, and so we do some imputation based on that. Um, we also plot the black owned acreage from the national census of agriculture data, not just the, the county level measures, which are available for a longer time horizon. And so what we can do here is we can, we demonstrate consistency with our county level measures, um, and you can just get a sense of the variation um, depending on which level of partially owned acreage that we include. Okay, and so I'm going to at the end give you our preferred specification, like what the land loss value is given our preferred specification, but I'll also give you a range um, based on different decisions, right? Like what if we use all the part, part own acreage and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, let's see, estimates of black owned land from other contemporaneous sources, such as state tax records, USDA land surveys, uh, census of agriculture coverage measurement studies, and spot checks indicate that the census of agriculture may consistently undercount black-owned farm acreage by 15% or more. 
And so we adjust the census of agriculture acreage estimates for that 15% undercount in our analysis. Okay. One of the benefits of using county level data is that land values varied um, by county. Right? And so this allows us to create loss estimates that are more fine grained than if we were just using some sort of average national land value um, uh, in, our, in our calculations. After 1945, the Census of Agriculture reports the county average value of land and buildings per acre. So this is going to be, oh, I'll show you in a, um, in a second. Um, prior to that, so prior to 1945, they report three different values total value of farms for operators, total value of land and buildings for full owners, um, and total value of land and buildings for part owners. So one thing that we do in order to get some consistency with the 1945 measures for before is we calculate this average dollar per acre um, using the corresponding acreage of operators, full owners, or part owners um, to get this comparable measure. Uh, so let me show you here. So what I'm showing you here um, are the nominal dollar per acre values using all four value measures available in the data. Each dot represents a year county observation. And so for our estimates, we use the consistent value measures for the post-1945 period. Um, and then we also report a range of estimates using either the minimum value of those you know, green, red, and blue dots in the pre-1945 era, um, the maximum value of those three, or some average value of those three. Okay? So again, when we present a range, the lowest range that we're going to present to you for our estimate will be using the minimum land values and no part ownership, for example. Okay. Um, okay. Our data are available in roughly five-year increments. However, we would like to compound land losses yearly. So we calculate yearly land losses as even losses between two reported acreage endpoints. Right? So for example, if 1,000 acres were lost in a county between 1920 and 1925, we would attribute 200 lost acres yearly between that period. Okay? We do the same thing with the land values because land values are changing over time as well. Um, and we report those land values as the average between the two um, recorded endpoints. This then gives us a county year data set with both yearly changes in acreage, which are typically yearly losses in acreage, um, and yearly nominal land values. Okay? We then multiply the yearly land acreage losses by the yearly land values right, to get yearly land loss values. Say that five times fast. Um, okay. Finally, we create cumulative loss values over time by compounding the yearly values. So we apply returns uh, to these values both for the appreciation of the land and the net income the land might possibly provide. Okay. Um, research studies find very high returns to agricultural land in the United States, um, over 10% after the Great Depression. Even higher returns have been estimated for the South during periods when rates of black land loss were high, um, particularly very fertile areas like the Mississippi Delta region. So we compound yearly land loss values from 1920 to 1997 at a rate of, um, a rate of return of 6% per year for uh, the appreciation of the lost land values and a rate of return of 5% per year for the income the land would provide. Um, for like an 11 percent return. And while we stop accumulating the land losses in 1997, we continue the compounding to 2020. That's when our paper was, when, our, when we finished our data period. So our preferred specification, which is using the imputed part ownership share and the corresponding pre-1945 um, value measures, yields a cumulative value of black land loss of roughly $326 billion. Depending on the specification, our results yield a low of about $265 billion. Again, that's if we use um, none of the part-owned acreage um, and if we use the minimum land values in the pre-1945 period, to a high of about $359 billion if we use all of the part-owned acreage and if we use the maximum land values in the pre-1945 period. 
Put in context, $326 billion is nearly as much as the current market capitalization of Netflix, Starbucks, and Target combined, um, which is $328 billion, last I checked. Uh, yet it's only 2.3% of the estimated racial wealth gap of $14 trillion. Thus, while the value of black agricultural land loss represents a significant source of lost wealth, it's still only part of the story of the overall racial wealth gap. We also view our $326 billion estimate to be a conservative estimate of the value of black land loss for multiple reasons. First, we use conservative rates of return on agricultural land in our calculations. Second, due to the data limitations of the county level data, uh, we began our calculations in 1920, which is a full decade after the peak of um, black land ownership in 1910, right? So that's a full, um, uh, it, our estimate doesn't account for the lost acreage in those first 10 years. Finally, we don't include other potential benefits to land ownership in our estimate, such as the ability of landowners to have more control over their labor um, and free time, more access to capital to invest in other business ventures, more resources to provide access to high quality education for their children so that the next generation can experience upward mobility. Um, and um, uh, therefore, you know, think of this as a conservative estimate. Uh, these are things that we're looking to model going forward. Um, and I think I will stop there. So some of these questions that we have are, are kind of uh, nitpicky data questions. Some are big picture. Uh, but let me start with one of the, the big ones, uh, uh, because this was a point that Dania was just making. Uh, <clears throat> you can look at the present value uh, of the estimated uh, land losses themselves, which uh, my ballpark number is that's also about 10% of the value of U.S. Farmland, I mean, just crude back of the envelope. Uh, <clears throat> but there's so many other things that happen when you have uh, a cumulative process of, you know, years of uh, low assets and how they affect uh, education, human capital development. Uh, I come from an area in central Pennsylvania with a lot of farmland. There's a lot of rich farmers. They don't get rich. The rich ones aren't rich because they grow crops. Because farmers grow three things, crops, subsidy payments, and residential subdivisions. The ones who are really rich are the ones that, in, my, in our experience, have been, have been doing that. So there's all these other mechanisms. So let me lead off with uh, Ania, and then maybe uh, uh, Thomas and Bryce want to chime in a little bit about broadening out what some of the effects of this uh, reduction in in uh, uh, assets in the past uh, has, uh, you know, beyond just the, the, the value of land. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a great question. So I think everybody can hear me. Um, right, this is a story about wealth accumulation, right? And, and, and wealth is important for many reasons. Wealth provides um, access to opportunity. Wealth provides protective safety nets, right? Um, wealth can be protective of your health, <laughs> right? Um, and, and I think most importantly, one of the things that we know is that wealth is intergenerationally transmitted, right? And it's not just through um, estate planning and things like that. It's your parents use their um, equity in their home to help pay for your college education, right? Like leaving you hopefully debt free a bit for, you know, for your starting, right? Like that's a transfer, that's a living transfer, right? Um, and so the fact that this large chunk of wealth building opportunity was stripped, right, from, um, many black landowners at a time um, early, right? Like early in our history, um, uh, before houses cost $1.4 million, in, right? Like, right, it's, 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 uh, it's important to recognize um, that wealth has so many more implications than just this dollar value. 
Yeah, just let me chime in. So I think that, uh, first of all, thank you to, uh, to Denise and Bryce for your brilliant presentations. But so a lot of what we're talking about now is in addition to the loss of the land value, what are additional um, kind of what negative wealth impacts? And those are all incredibly important. The one thing I would like to, to add is there's also non-economic harm, harm to things like that are hard to measure, a sense of a family's heritage, a sense of uh, kind of historical importance of kind of land or cultural importance. And as a result of this, we've had uh, a lot of erasure of these important kind of historic cultural heritage. And I think that, um, you know, I know a lot of students in general, a lot of law students, a lot of subset of law students here at BC Law School talk about, for example, experiencing imposter syndrome. And when you don't have people who look like you, who are in important positions as mentors, as models, as folks to inspire you, you can feel like an outlier. I think W.E.B. Du Bois, to cite him again, had an article, I think it was in 1913, and in that article, he demonstrated that 80% of the black uh, professional class were black landowners. Not to say that that same group of people, if they had maintained that ownership, would be farmers and landowners today, but they wouldn't be desperately poor. You would have a more robust black professional and middle, middle class. You would have, for black children coming up, models of uh, what it would be to be in a, in a significant position. Um, and so I just think that, you know, I see that every day. I see that in my classes. Um, and if there had been that alternative history, we would have uh, just much greater kind of inclusion and I think in terms of kind of economic and social mobility. And quick, quickly, just to build on Thomas's point um, yeah I think you can see that the uh, black land ownership often let, helped uh, facilitate black political activism like I mentioned the colored farmers alliance and then the civil rights movement um, and, and many many of the northern activists who went to the south said that they couldn't have done it without black farmers so there's you know Black landowners gave the land to found Wilberforce University, or they, you know, helped buy the land, which was the first black private college in Ohio. So anyway, there were many social benefits too, and if that hadn't been taken away, the political situation could be much different. Just, just as a quick follow-up, uh, <clears throat> there's been a fair amount of research in recent years uh, looking at um, uh, housing, the subject that Lisa and colleagues will be discussing later that uh, econometrically uh, tease out actual numerical estimates of some of the links between uh, home ownership uh, in residential housing and uh, some of these things that have been talking about, about educational outcomes, uh, even about things like whether kids um, have, interact with uh, the criminal justice system uh, and so on. And these have, uh, to many uh, economists, including myself, have turned out to be sometimes surprisingly strong. Um, as a PhD, former faculty member at a university, I'm always required at some point to talk about future research. Do you, do you think there's scope for research focusing on uh, uh, trying to get more numerical estimates or, or, or other uh, hard information on some of the effects you've been talking about uh, for farmland as opposed to just housing? <coughs> yes is an acceptable yeah. response. Uh, we, we've talked about looking at, there's a, there's a great book, I can't remember the name of it, but it's by Sharon Holt, and um, it's about, it, it, it's kind of, it's about how black people saved money when they were sharecroppers and did odd jobs and so on to make extra money in order to buy farms. And a theme in her book is that when they had the farm, you know, they had better control of their free time and they made, they made a lot more money for working 
less hours than they had before. Um, and we, we've talked about, people have tried to put this into numbers, you know, how much a sharecropper got paid per hour versus how much their, you know, boss took. And, try, uh, you know, people have actually estimated how much that's worth today. So we, we've talked about trying to look at this difference, how much more of their labor they could have captured if they owned a farm, for example. So we have looked, and we've, we've also talked about looking at how much more, we have data on how much more educated the children of landowners were, and their people have tried to quantify how much that's worth, so we've talked about doing that kind of thing as well. And just quickly, so for us that would involve a, a, a model where we include sort of multiplier effects into what we've already estimated, right? That's the, that's the idea. And just shortly, we, we, there's also opportunities both in terms of quantitative and qualitative. So one of the ways Steve and I got to know each other is I got a Ford Foundation grant early in my career to study some of the impacts of black land loss. And our, we have a field site in eastern North Carolina in Halifax County. Uh, and Gary Grant, who Bryce had on one of his slides, is from that community. It's called Tillery. Uh, Tillery was one of the 10 black farm communities created by that Farm Security Administration that was then uh, a narrative created that it was socialist and communist and they ended it. The Farm Security Administration wasn't perfect. It actually was racialized, but it did give opportunities. And one of the things, for example, in a community like Tillery was the Tillery community, right? So these were families that had formerly leased land, been sharecroppers, had not had the opportunity to be farm owners. Tillery had in Halifax <laughs> County the first family that had registered to vote. It was actually Gary's mother. Gary's mother then and her parents then used that position they had as landowners to register a number of other uh, black folks in, uh, in Halifax County. Uh, they then initially were pushing for more equitable um, schools, public schools for their children. So they played, so, so some of this through qualitative study, you can kind of tease out some of the, um, the kind of the multiplier positive impacts of, uh, in this case, being a farmland owner. Um, let me now turn to uh, a little bit about some of the numbers just for a minute, a little more uh, digging into the details. And uh, we're not going to put the slides up, but I, I know you can't see this in the back of the room. Unless your eyes are a lot better than mine are. You brought your opera glasses. But this is, um, I think, slide six uh, from the second presentation. And it shows, uh, you know, the rapid decline in black-owned acreage. Uh, from 1910 to 1990, but then from 1990 to 2010, it seems to bounce up again, which, uh, you know, I haven't heard much about. Let me throw out a couple of these, and then uh, people can address any of them or, or uh, if they care to. Um, on this one, you saw that the, the uh, rate of black ownership fell uh, and, and white ownership did not. Uh, and the, the variable here is acreage, not numbers of farms. Um, a lot of other things have been going on in farmland and farming <coughs> over this last century. Obviously, the number of farmers uh, has gone down tremendously. Most farmers, many farmers now, uh, if you just count them, are part-time, although most of the production is by a small number of large operators. Uh, also, there's been a large shift in uh, the way the legal form uh, of farms where even uh, I believe in, at least in Wisconsin, even sort of mid-sized farms moved from family, uh, you know, basically uh, 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 individual farming entrepreneurs uh, to a corporation and even uh, real estate investment trusts and LLCs and other forms. So there's, in fact, Lisa teaches a course on all this little plug. So I guess my question there is, uh, you know, how do um, uh, have black farmers experienced something similar or different than white farmers when it comes to this, you know, sort of shift to more corporate uh, uh, forms of ownership? Does any of that uh, create any issues for how we construct the data? Uh, you know, what's up with this 
will turn up in the data in the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, let me just throw out those data questions uh, for any of the, uh, maybe you, you can start. Yeah, I'll start with just a quick um, clarification with the data. I think um, part of the part of the tick up at the end again is um, uh, a little bit of a change in the methodology of what the census of agriculture was doing, and so again, that's why we don't. I put the graph out through 20, 2002 past there, but um, we didn't use those numbers in our in our calculation for that reason. Um, so I should probably clarify that uh, a, a little better. Um, good questions. There's a lot going on, um, and in my, I have a presentation this afternoon where I'll talk about the census more. But um, uh, basically, the Census Bureau ran. The, okay, I'll try not to get too technical. The Census Bureau ran the census till '97. Census of Agriculture. Then it switched to USDA. USDA started. Cha it changed the methodology. I think every year since '97, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and they're even getting rid of the, I don't think they're even counting primary farm operator anymore, which means that used to be the thing everybody used to like count the number of farm farmers. Anyway, um, they, the, the new methodology has increased the counts of all farmers, um, and they, you don't have to even grow anything to be counted as a farmer. 22% of farmers in the 2017 census, I think, grew, grew nothing at all, they, or they had no sales. So anyway, the, the uptick could be black people who own land but do not farm, but be, they, they meet the technical definition of a farm. And it's something that we're, we've, we've looked at a lot and we're going to address in a longer paper. Um, as far as the Corporate farming and so on, I also mentioned this in the afternoon, but there, there are fewer than 500 commercial family farmers, as USDA defines it, in 2017, whereas there were 290,000 white farmers, uh, commercial farmers. And the commercial farms produce 50% of sales. And so black people are, generally speaking, locked out of commercial farming. And we've also looked at organic farming and direct sales, which is farm, like farmer's market kind of farming, those are also dominated by the largest farms. And black people basically haven't had an opportunity to be involved in that part of the farm economy. And Tom Vilsack, I mean, I, I, if you want to read it, you can read a long article that we wrote in the counter a few years ago, but he basically said, I don't want, I want to try to represent what he said fairly, but he essentially said black farmers should try to do organic and farmer's market sales, which is insulting, but also they, they don't really have the opportunity because those are also dominated by commercial farms. So, um, Let's do uh, just another one or two, and then we'll <clears throat> open it up. Um, this is specific for Bryce. Oh. It's the green that turns it on. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Thomas, did you? That's our economist <laughs> moderator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Bryce, you very briefly mentioned black landowners going back to the 1600s in some cases, you know, uh, you know pre-Civil War and so on. You want to just... Comment on that, and what became of those? What became of those families? Um, there's a very interesting study I recently found by a genealogist named Paul Heinig, and he he has a study where he says he's documented 80 percent, over 80 percent of the free families, free black families in from from Virginia to South Carolina before the Revolutionary War, and he found that a lot of these families came from the Eastern Shore region of Virginia and Maryland. Um, and many of them had a, a black father and a white mother. And they, it, it, was, it was relatively easier, I guess you could say, for black people to own land in the mid-1600s in Virginia. It wasn't easy 
you know, and they didn't have the rights of white people, but there were, there were some, there were some, and they tended to, to, to settle in what they're, you know, what people call frontier areas, um, where they're, you know, they weren't as subject to control of the white government. And yeah, some of these areas they owned over a thousand acres and these families spread out to Ohio and even as far as California, it's very, it's very, uh, remarkable. And then the Spanish territories, there were, there were landowners and the, there were landowners in the Dutch colony in New York. So, yeah. Well, I have a few more questions written here, but why not open it up to the, the group? I'm going to stand up and call on people. If I stand up, I get a better view of everyone. I don't need this. I need this. <laughs> Actually, I teach 300 students. They're recording it. So well, they're recording it, and I so, do need it. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I used to teach 300 people without a microphone. At least I claim I taught them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just uh, ask your question. You can either direct it to an individual or to the entire panel. Oh, and we have microphones. Great. Please. Hello. Hello, my name is Saskia Van James. I work at Repair America Collective. I've helped pass reparations policies here in Massachusetts. My work um, sparked the city of Boston to pass their reparations policies. I'm also the co-founder of the first reparatory justice-based program here in Massachusetts, Grow to Consume, where we provide as a public health education um, how to grow um, and teach organic soil, organic plant health. I work with black, um, growers within the greater Boston area. And part of this education that we have discovered because we're reparatory justice based is a lot of people have trauma, intergenerational trauma. Um, and we start teaching them how to grow. Their response is, you're not gonna put me back out in those fields. Um, so there's, there's, there's more when you guys discuss about, you know, the, the value of uh, land loss and cultural, um, the cultural implications and also the harm from that. Um, Eco-terror is very much one of them. And through Repair America Collective, one of the conversations we're having is uh, awakening people to acknowledge that we still have loss of sovereignty, that black Americans have no sovereignty in body or in land. Therefore, we're allowed to be terrorized all across this country displacement and gentrification will continue forward. So the, the, the uh, case for land is through reparations to address loss of sovereignty still, um, so that we can become uh, recognized um, and to be more than just our skin color, to be recognized as American freedmen. Um, that's the name of our, of our community. And so what I wanna know is for you guys, when you're calculating like, here in Massachusetts, I noticed that wasn't one of the states that you guys showed here, and I do local you know, work and policy work. I'm in Cambridge, Boston. I'm talking to community organizers and doing data calculations. I know that for the state of Massachusetts, 96% of farmland is white owned. Less than 2% of it is towards black people. Um, it's like one point something. Um, here in Massachusetts. And with my program, I frequently have to develop transportation to go from the inner city out towards you know, the rural areas to, for people to even have access because we don't even have a community land trust within the greater Boston area for, for um, black Americans. So I wanted to know, like, when you calculate, what would be your recommendations to look at for da data attributes when calculating for land lost? Um, because one of the things that I'm looking at also is um, the fact that we were forced into an extractive of economy, that farming to this day is based upon an extractive economy, and that when we're talking about a regenerative economy, we need to acknowledge the elders of this land, um, and elders of this land are Native Americans and black Americans. We have over 400 experience of agricultural care on this land, but we were forced into an extractive method of agricultural. Um, so I wanted to know what would be your recommendations to look at the attributes for a regenerative economy when we're talking about agriculture, because I believe they're both in the the same and as part of reparatory, reparatory justice. So there, there's a lot embedded in there, and I think that's for anybody, any and all the panelists. Uh, okay, to just Thomas, one thing, we off? have a limited time for Q&A, so I appreciate your comments, but we, we need to have comments, a little, uh, questions a little more concise so we can get broad participation, but we'll, we'll answer that just going forward. So do you want to, I mean, one, one question I heard, I heard several. One was, um, here we are in Massachusetts, 
what do we know, what do we need to learn about uh, this phenomenon in this state and maybe uh, other parts of New England? Uh, well, I, I yeah, I, I have read there where black landowners in the colonial, you know, as early as the colonial period in New England. Um, I know for our for our study, yeah, we did focus on the the South, I guess, because it was kind of difficult. You know, it was complex to put the data set together, but we certainly don't want to, you know, limit ourselves from looking at the rest of the country. So, you know, at some point, we we probably will look at the rest of the country. I guess I'll add. I, I had the pleasure of. Um participating in a, a conference um, in the fall at, uh, I think, Harvard School of Public Health uh, put on that you were a panelist on, and I really appreciated um, um, all of your, your, your knowledge and your, your insights, especially with what's going on locally, right, with um, um, preparations and um, uh, repertory justice. And I guess, um, I, I mean, a theme that I maybe want to just pick up on um, from your comments are that um, this is why education and history are important too, right? Um, because if we don't know um, what happened, right, in the past, then we can sort of, you know, land and say, um, you know, oh, look at these disparities and can start making up any sort of reasons for, for what's behind them. And I think that's why the, the work that you do is important to be able to also say like, no, this has a history, there's a structure, and not only does it have a history, but it's still going, right? And that there's still issues um, within, our, within our institutions, within the structures, um, within our policies, right, that are still causing harm. Um, and so unless we uh, you know, deeply interrogate those and, and start to address them, any reparation work that we do is incomplete. I think that's what I We can uh, maybe address some of the other points you raised uh, over lunch and so on. Let's get a few more. Let, let me bounce back and forth uh, so I'm not geographically. Uh, here we go. Here's a, a colleague with a question. And uh, as our first colleague did, it'd be good if people identified themselves. Oh, hi. I'm Hiba Hafiz. I'm also a professor here at Boston College Law School. Um, I'm so excited about this conference, and thank you so much for your just really illuminating comments. Um, so my question's kind of big and tricky. <laughs> um, it's about um, whether or not there's a way of incorporating um, into your analysis of the monetary losses that black farmers suffered, um, so their lack of equal access to land and to higher quality land at non-discriminatory rates. Okay, so the hard questions uh, devolve to Thomas. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was going to say, as the non-economist, the non-quantitative, um, I, I just think your, your question is very important. I'm not going to give you a satisfying answer, but I'm going to tell you about this, um, this community in eastern North Carolina. That's the field site for this, uh, for this uh, study that Steve and I and a couple other people uh, have been part of. So you have this, this was the, I mentioned that there were two black, uh, ten black New Deal farm communities established during the New Deal under this Farm Security Administration. Um, the one in Tillery, North Carolina, if you looked at just that community, it's the largest of the 10. But what we stumbled upon when we visited it, and it had always been perceived as being this all black New Deal farm community. When, I, when we were scouting out field sites, we met with Gary, and Gary just made some offhanded comment about the white New Deal uh, farm community created in the same county. And, you know, there were a hundred of these counties, uh, these communities created in the country. I was like, what's the chances that there were two in the same county? It turns out that Tillery, although it's always been seen as the black New Deal, set, uh, New Deal what they call resettlement community, was actually part of the, the overall community called the Roanoke Farms, um, resettlement community, and Tillery was just the black part. So there was a white 
part for white families, a black part, because of Jim Crow norms. They were separated by 10 miles. So that became an interesting comparative. So we accumulated uh, the deeds for all 200 properties. There are basically 100 on the black side, 100 on the white side. And what's important about you is when I just went out into the county, I talked to some random people um, about the study. The narrative was, oh, you know, the black tillery was a complete failure. And the narrative was, I, I literally had somebody tell me this. They said, you know, is it really our fault that those black folks who got this free land wasted it by buying $1,000 suits and Cadillacs? Turns out that nobody got free land. It was the innovation at that time was a 30-year mortgage. The, um, so each of the families had to buy. When we looked at the deeds and we looked at the, um, what they paid per acre, it turns out that the black families were required to pay something like 20% more per acre for their land. Okay, and that, but then we found out that on the white section of the property, all of the farmers were able to grow tobacco, which was the biggest cash crop. None of the families on the black side, because it turns out that the soil quality was substantially inferior on the black side. So they're paying 20% more per acre for acreage that is, by definition, less valuable. So there was already disadvantage built into there. But then they had these supervisors for these programs, and at every critical juncture, the, far, the supervisor for this Roanoke Farms project, who basically was a white supremacist, made decisions to advantage the white families and disadvantage the black families. For example, I, I'll just end on this. There was significant opportunities for off-farm income. There were some defense industries in the area, and basically he allowed the white families to earn off-farm income, but denied the black families the opportunity to do the same. But anyway, so um, let me just stop there. And I just, I'll qu I just will quickly add um, that from a from a research perspective, right, and as an economist who works with um, data analysis of like large data sets, right, things like that. Um, uh, these are the stories and these are the archives and the historical records that we need to talk about and know about, right? But there will be people who you tell them that and they say, oh, you gave me one example, right? Like, and so this is also why in conjunction with that, we need the big data story, right? But the big data story doesn't tell it all. And so we need, right? Like, and so I guess, you know, um, my point that I add is that that's part of why I've been so excited about the, the group we put together because we've got folks who have these different levels of expertise and, and bring these different things to the table. And I think these are the types of um, collective research efforts we need to continue to engage in. For those that want to learn more about the Tillery case, uh, Thomas is a lead art, uh, author on an article uh, a few years ago in the, was it the Florida State Law Review? Uh, yes. Yeah, so assigned reading. Uh, let's take a question from the middle. Yes, please, sir. Uh, oh, Mike? Thank you very much. Ryan Norman. I'm the owner of Trustbridge Renewable Energy. Uh, so we're a renewable energy firm that focuses specifically on developing commercial scale projects, renewable projects on land owned by people of color. Um, I will have a quick comment and it goes to the question. But um, in, in my, my space, I see a continuation of these negative impacts of minority land loss uh, in the renewable energy transition. Uh, there's trillions of dollars that are being injected into the economy that's based off of renewable energy. Every project, renewable energy project, is incumbent or dependent on siting a project on land. Uh, so there are hundreds of millions of dollars of lease payments that are being made annually. Um, I, I've spent 11 years doing it, leased thousands of acres. Uh, my first time leasing a black landowner was last year in Mississippi. Um, but out of, out of, and we've worked for some of the largest companies in, in the world. Um, I, I'm I, my, my comment is about the complexity of this. So we have the minority land loss where there's a loss of land, um, so we don't have as much land to go site for, on black people. But on top of that, uh, the way that the utilities 
have built out our infrastructure grid throughout the country. Uh, and the pockets, <clears throat> the pockets that that infrastructure is around, it's around white only for, for obvious reasons with redlining and different things. Uh, so now the land that black people own uh, is not necessarily considered optimal uh, because of its proximity to infrastructure. So my question is, um, do you have any recommend policy recommendation for a practitioner like myself um, that we can try to advance as we go out and try to pull black landers on owners into this energy transition? Because um, it's my idea, it's my thought that we need policy support uh, at, at a state level to um, kind of put this at a, at, on an equal footing to, to bring black landowners in. Okay, so once again, I'm, I'm gonna weigh in. I've, I've got my quantitative people here, but um, so, so two things. One is kind of self-serving. Um, you know, we do have that um, legal reform and policy laboratory uh, aspect of our initiative. And that's where I am hoping that we are successful in getting funding as we, you know, basically identify or have people identify for us issues that are relevant. Like that's an incredibly sad but fascinating issue ripe for research, right? Um, so the, so the only thing I'm gonna say, in the last few years, there's been a movement mostly in urban areas to map redlining. So there's been mapping projects in Seattle, in the Twin Cities, in Minnesota, in Richmond, Virginia. They did some redlining mapping in Washington, D.C. And what I think is helpful is that, um, especially with um, places where people didn't think there was virulent racism, so, I, so the North, the Midwest, right? So I call it Jim Crow of the North or the Midwest. And it's at least been helpful to have those maps, have an understanding those maps visually manifest disadvantage in a way that had been rendered invisible. So if you're gonna begin a policy discussion, you gotta know what is the lay of the land. And I think those, that those mapping projects have been incredibly uh, helpful to kind of um, bust the myth that racism was just in the South, right? So I think a similar like starting point in the, in the types of properties that you're mentioning, I mean, I don't think any, like the, the, the number of people who are even, who know about that issue, you know, might be you and, you know, I don't know, maybe 100 people, I don't know. It, it's a small subset, but I think it would be helpful to, to, you know, to do a similar thing in terms of raising awareness. And then with that, hopefully that can catalyze additional research and policy solutions. I, I don't know if you notice a pattern, but I, I, I look at Thomas and ask him to speak so that I can have time to think. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but one of the things that um, um, I have advocated for, I wrote a paper you know, called Calling All Policy Wonks, right, is that the expertise and the, and the people that we need in this sort of um, next phase in the battle for right, civil rights are are right, legislative experts, um, policy experts, the people who are gonna read through the 400 pages of bill and find the two lines that either purposefully or unpurposefully um, disadvantage black people or other people, right? Um, Bryce mentioned um, all of the New Deal era policies that were meant to be race neutral, right, on their face, but either purposefully or, right, the cynic in me, right, um, or, or not disadvantaged black people. And so I guess my answer to that is that it's a call for um, um, more of us to get involved in, in that level of expertise um, so that we're not retroactively fighting policies, right? That once they're already passed, it's like, oh, look what it's doing to black people, right? That we can, before that happens, say, wait a minute, right? Like, let's vocalize why this is not a good idea or at least get that line and that provision struck, right, from the, from the bill. So we're, we're uh, I think- Five minutes. I, I was told, uh, I was told we're out of time and I was told five minutes. Let's go for five So we'll go for five we, minutes. We started late, let's, so why don't you take a couple yeah, more questions? Yeah. Okay. Let's do a lightning round. So let's take uh, like three questions 
or so quick questions, and then quick answers, you know, uh, potpourri. So uh, let me start on the far left. Uh, okay, the gentleman in the back and then the woman in front of him. Quick question. Oh. <laughs> Time's up. No. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ramfis Medina. I'm an undergraduate urban studies student at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. My question is more for Mr. Mitchell, kind of continuing on this thread that we're on. So, like, given just, like, the current social climate of just, like, the United States, everything that's going on, critical race theory getting taken out of schools, all these other things, environmental justice, the spatial implications of, like, these issues, like, in your own work, like, how do you, I guess, like, bolster it or, like, make it more enduring so that it might survive some of these more, like, political shifts and, uh, attacks mm -hmm. on the reparation movement that has been developing for so long and continues to ebb and flow. Okay, let's get a few more questions on the, uh, the, uh, the woman in front. Tim, uh. Hi, I'm uh, Lorraine Payne Wheeler. I'm an attorney in Roxbury. And I was just going to say that we still see a lot of families, black families, losing land because when the church was set up or when the parents um, thought about uh, how uh, their children would inherit this land, and, um, but we see that somebody takes them to court for a partition. We see that um, the church was set up as a national church, and now these national leaders want to take this local land that the church only exists because local African-American women donated money to this church. Okay, we'll take one more from around here, and then we'll have quick I answers. Was, I think she had her hand yeah, uh, We've had a couple hands. Who? Uh, sorry, we're not going to be able to get to everyone. Yeah. Sorry, um, Zoraida Fernandez, I'm an attorney and also doing some independent research on these issues. My question was more about the 1910, if you could expand more on the historical and political economic kind of forces going on. Like I see the chart and it's just like a precipitous decline around that 1910 time frame. Okay, hey, quick uh, responses to any or so all. I'll just respond to the, to the first question, right? So, you know, oftentimes I hear people, you know, talk about there's, you know, and it's true, there's multiple overlapping existential threats, there's, there's backlash, there's, you know, um, and, you know, my fundamental outlook on life, or one of my, fun, is that life is in the struggle. There's always been struggle. What people overcame before, if they had given up and, uh, you know, gotten demoralized, I wouldn't be sitting here, half the people in this room wouldn't be sitting here. So I just accept that as a normal functioning part of life. Like, there's going to be struggle. And I need to be in the struggle, right? The other thing is that a lot of the issues I focused on um, were just simply overlooked. There weren't, um, um, when I began my research, you know, there was some academic work on this, but it was, um, it didn't actually get into the weeds. It didn't somewhat challenge some of the fundamental assumptions and narratives that were created. Um, that help facilitate this land loss. So I was willing to be that's the more nerdy, geeky side of me. I was like, let, let, let's get into the weeds and, and examine this in a fine-grained way. And I was basically able to demystify or uh, debunk a lot of that. But also it was um, not sufficient for me to point out the great injustice. I was like, well, what are we offering? So thinking proactively of, well, what would be a fairer property regime? And part of that did re require the, you know, the very nerdy, geeky thinking about, well, what would be possible solutions? So I think that, you know, a lot of that had been not done at that level, right? A lot of pointing out of the injustice, but not then something proactively to offer. Um, and then just the other non-academic side of me um, is, you know, I, I've, I right out of college worked on Capitol Hill. I didn't, you know, I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. I, there was a lot of ugly. I didn't want to work in the belly of the beast, but I wanted to do policy stuff. And so, you know, I've been engaged in a number of high-level battles 
Um, and part of it is knowing how to build a ground game, how to counteract. Uh, I mean, that part of me may be perverse. I enjoy those fights. Um, I mean, there's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of reading people and having those skills. Quick answers uh, from the others to any of the other questions. Um, I'll answer the second question, even though this is a question Thomas should answer, but I'll put my Thomas hat on and just say that he's right. Like, this is what he, this is part of what he does is, is, is work on battling these partition sales, these right, like, um, and, and fighting that fight. Um, and then another um, uh, aspect that I would also imagine Thomas would say is that, right, we need estate planning. We need um, much more of that, especially right in the, in the black community. And for 1910, um, yeah, the peak was in the early 1910s, and then there was a downturn in the farm economy, uh, I believe in 1914, and the government actually started to step in in a bigger way then. And from the beginning, you know, it was it was it was segregated. It was really more than segregated because it was almost whites only, and the South also started to have more capital intensive farming at that time and black people were not able to take part in that. I'm sorry, so, just one, one thing I mean, I'm just, that you mentioned in uh, Massachusetts and partition. One of the bills, um, we've had five states introduce our bill this year where we just basically won in the state of Washington. We have a bill in the Massachusetts legislature, but we are only at the beginning of building the ground game. We have the American Farmland Trust. We actually have the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. But we need a more, much more robust coalition in Massachusetts if we're going to have any hope. So if anybody who wants to join in that effort, feel free to let David Price or me know. <laughs>